Ecclesiastes chapter 4 today. We've been making our way through the book of Ecclesiastes. So if you're new here today, I'll try to help catch you up just a little bit. Uh, we believe that the writer of Ecclesiastes is the son of King David, who is Solomon. Uh, Solomon was the wealthiest and wisest, most sought after king in all of his time and in all of history, especially in his day. He was a man that people would come and frequent and visit and desire to know. Uh, they, they would not just want to know him, but they would want to know the things that he knew. That his wisdom was not just in the spiritual, but his wisdom was in the very practical, everyday nature of life. He knew things in the area of science and, and of geology, geography, of the heavens, like, like, like Solomon was a guy that God just blessed with the gift of knowing a lot of stuff. Matter of fact, he knew so much stuff and he was so wise that he was good at just amassing wealth, that he was good at having uh, lots of servants and building lots of buildings and architecture and gardens. And he was truly the man who could say, I have done it all. And maybe some of you guys have even made that profession. Like, man, I lived the, before, I li like, I've done it all. But none of you have done it like Solomon did it. Like, like, when it came to riches, Solomon had all the abundance that he ever could want. When it came to women, had too many women. Like, like Solomon, Solomon just like, he, he just had and did. Matter of fact, chapter 2, he goes through and he lists all of his accomplishments and desires that he lived out. He talks about his life. And, and in so doing, he's showing to us throughout the book of Ecclesiastes, the end of all of these things that we might think bring life in life. Matter of fact, what he's actually doing, and he does this through these two key phrases that he repeats throughout the entire book, is he shows us the meaningless, meaning, meaninglessness, that's a hard word to say, yo, the meaninglessness, got it, of everything that's under the sun. He uses these two key phrases. Key phrases is, number one, under the sun. Everything that's under the sun is everything that relates to reality and to this life and to things that are not in heaven. Just the everyday natural five senses and the seasons of life and the things that we live out and the things that we pursue are all the things that are under the sun. And he brings us to the end of each one of those things, and he tells us that they are, say it with me, meaningless. meaningless. Matter of fact, this is a Hebrew word that he uses throughout the book that has become a buzzword here, not only at Hosanna, but in our life groups as well. And it's the word hevel. The word hevel really is a, a, a word that, that basically means like a vapor. It would be like that guy who pulls out his vape pen, blows a puff of smoke. You see the vape as it goes out, and it's here for a second, and then it's gone. That it appears to have substance, but it really does not have any. That as soon as it comes out, as soon as it goes away, as soon as it seems to take on a form, it shifts as quickly that it can be manipulated and shifted and changed just like our lives, that it never stays the same, and it's always shifting and always moving, it might even appear to have substance, but our life is so brief in comparison to eternity that it's like a vapor, it's here today, gone tomorrow, and he wants to equate that all of these areas of life that we might grab onto to think, now this is living, so we attempt to grab onto it, it would be the same as attempting to grab on to a vape and to hold it and to grasp it and to possess it, that it's an impossibility because even though it appears to have life, it is not life for truly it is meaningless or as your version might say, vanity or as your version might say, empty. It is hevel. And what he is doing in every chapter is bringing up different aspects of life to show us just how empty they really are, just how hevel they really are as quickly as it appears is as quickly as it will dissipate. He begins in verse 7 by describing to us another thing that is meaningless, another thing that is hevel. He says in verse 7, again, I saw something, what? Uh, or the word? Hevel. I saw something else that was hevel under the sun, something else that was not of the kingdom of God, that was in the kingdom of earth, that man gravitate towards, and it's meaningless, and this is what it is. There was a man that was all what? And if, there was, if the man was all alone, that means he was lonely. Can you all say, if the man was all alone, okay, this is like second grade grammar English. If the man was all alone, he was, he was lonely. Now, loneliness is something we can all relate to. Now, it may not be true of you today. 
but it has probably been true of you at some point in your life. That for some of you, it's loneliness is because truly you are all alone physically. And for some of you, this feeling of loneliness might be the fact that you might be seated in a crowd but still feel lonely. That I know people that go out in a search to fulfill this loneliness that's inside of them. And they might hang out in a party or in a club or in a bar full of people and still feel like they're the only one that's in this, that entire space that actually knows who they are. That's because loneliness, loneliness, as you jot this down in your bulletins, is a deep cry from the soul that says, I need something. Loneliness and the feeling of loneliness is our soul's cry saying, I need something. There's something that I need. Maybe that something you need is someone that you need. Loneliness, we find, is a very dangerous condition. Because with loneliness comes the danger of misinterpreting loneliness as an accusation. Loneliness accuses you. And that accusation, the accusation actually of loneliness comes in this form. Something is wrong with me. If my soul is crying that I need something and I'm not finding that something or that someone, accusation, I'm sorry, loneliness can bring an accusation against the person to say, now something is wrong with you. Because if something wasn't wrong with you, then you wouldn't have these feelings of loneliness. There's something that may, you might be accused of by loneliness is that you are unwanted. So loneliness brings the accusation that you are un. Wanted. For some, it's undateable. For some, it's unlovable. For some, you might feel like, man, I, I, I'm, in, I'm in a classroom and I got 32 other students or I got 150 other students in, in just my class, and yet I feel so, so lonely. Maybe it's because I'm uncool. Maybe it's because I'm worthless. Maybe it's because I'm annoying or a nuisance or ugly. And the accusations of loneliness can bring upon us this 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 compounding issue to not have what it takes to fulfill the loneliness because we buy into the lie instead of embracing what we really need, and that is the truth. And what is the truth? The truth is God has designed all of us to share in life, to both know and to be known. That God has designed each one of us to, to be known by somebody and to be accepted by them. And there's a desire that's inside of our heart. Every single one of us have it to be known by somebody and to have that person that knows us to accept us. For them to know how we think and to know how we feel and to know what our desires are and to accept us the way that we are. That's a desire, a craving inside of our soul that if we do not have, we have loneliness. This is the problem with most marriages I find in the church is that there are two people that sought after knowing each other in a season called dating. I want to know everything about your girl. And so she says everything about her, right? <laughs> and then she's like, what about you? And he just gives a few facts. And she's like, I'll take them, right? And then there's this, there's this pursuit of wanting to know each other and accept each other. And at some point in the marriage, there is this divide because I know enough about you, you know enough about me. And so now there's no longer this pursuit of knowledge of each other and of knowing and of accepting each other. And as a result, there's a disconnect. You can be married, yet you're laying next to a person in a bed and you feel just as lonely as you felt before you were even married. And this creates inside of you this, this, this accusation of what is wrong with me. However, people, and listen, I need you to hear me on this. Some people, you might be sitting in this room and you're like, yeah, but I'll even take a husband that is disconnected from me, please, right? Like, because for me, there's such a disconnection when it comes to my loneliness and my isolation that circumstantially I have nobody. Some people actually find themselves isolated and lonely for a number of reasons, but the first of which, jot this down, is simply just circumstantial. Yeah, just simply circumstances has led to you just feeling and or being lonely. Well, for this man, we actually find in verse 8, this is what he writes. That there was a man that was all alone, and he had neither son nor what? Brother. Brother. 
Now, now this is this man's circumstances that surround his loneliness. And what this actually did, this was probably out of this man's control. And in the same way, you too can be out of control of the circumstances that maybe surround your lonely season. You weren't in control of your family dynamic, and so you, I mean, you, you, you didn't determine how many brothers or sisters you had and at what age and if they were close to you at all. I mean, maybe you, don't, you didn't have that. Maybe for some of you, you have brothers and sisters, but they're too dysfunctional for you to even connect with. Yeah. Maybe for some of you, you are the dysfunction, and that's why they don't connect with you, right? Yeah. I mean, I'm, sure, I'm sure we would all love to choose our brothers and sisters. Like, I'll take two brothers and two sisters, and they all must serve me. You know what I mean? Like, we, but we didn't get that choice. We didn't ask to be married. Or I'm sorry. We didn't ask to be born into the family we were born into. Maybe you have circumstances that are out of your control that, that have created this lonely season that you're in. Like you, maybe you never asked to move cities. Like, like you never asked, like, okay, I, I would love to have uh, no longer be in this church community and now be stuck in this church community. We work so hard to develop relationships with this church community. And now I'm in this church community. It's just not the same. The memories are not the same, and the relationships are not the same. I never asked to change schools. My parents didn't ask me. Dad got a job. They moved us, and now I'm just in this place. Man, if you've ever left a long-time peer group, you know how difficult it is to reconnect, is it not? And we have a tendency to reminisce about old times, the way things used to be, wondering why it's such a struggle to make new connections. But the thing is, is you'll never be able to go back to those seasons because those seasons have passed. So yes, circumstances outside of your control can create loneliness. But in the case with this man, I want to invite you, there's something a little deeper wrong with him. There's something a little deeper going on in his life. It wasn't just the fact that he had no son or no brother. It wasn't just the circumstances. Matter of fact, this was actually self-inflicted. The reason why we know it's self-inflicted, because as we jump into the next verse, we find that there was no end to his toil. This was the man's issue. Yet his eyes were not content with his wealth. What was the method of this man's isolation? He was a workaholic. Thank you. Matter of fact, the, the, the text tells us directly that there was, there was no end to his toil. Right? Just waiting for whoever's clicking my slides to actually do it. <laughs> Boom. Yeah, there it is. There was no end to his what? Or a better term may be that he was a, listen, he was a busy aholic. Maybe it wasn't just that he was a workaholic, because we love to throw out the term workaholic. But many of you guys, you're like, I got my 40 hours, and the reason why you're so isolated, why you're so disconnected, is not just because of your job, but it's because you busy yourself with anything else in life. This man was too busy for genuine relationships. He was too busy to be vulnerable with somebody else and to find somebody that was vulnerable to serve. However, we know, we know the problem with the busyaholic lifestyle. The busyaholic lifestyle doesn't actually produce life. I got a picture. Pictures always help. Listen, look at this cycle. Look at the busyaholic lifestyle. The, the, the reality is that the busyaholic, the person who busies their life and their mind and their schedule and their time with constant meetings, extra shifts, the watching of and the playing of and the doing of things that leave them actually disconnected, is that disconnection often leads to unhappiness. Because somebody is disconnected, they're not being fed in the area of relationships. The disconnection leads to an isolation. This isolation leads to a loneliness that creates an unhappiness inside of us. We don't know where it's coming from, and we don't know why it is. We just know that it's there. So because of the disconnection, we're unhappy. But this is what most people do. Instead of going to God's word and instead of going to basic reasoning, isolation is leading to loneliness. So therefore, I need some people. I need somebody. What actually ends up happening is they just grab onto something to make them more busy. I need an extra hobby. I need an extra app. Oh, you know what? Work is not enough. You know what? I'm like, I'm not happy with my life. So I know what I'm going to do. I'm going to get another job. And oh man, it's like, okay, that job's not doing for me. And I know what I'm going to do. I'm going to go back to school. College will fix it. I know what's going to, if I just buy a boat that'll, and I just invest some time 
and, and, and the hobby of this thing, it's got to be my job, and it's got to be my life, and it's got to be this work environment. You know what? It's got to be my marriage. I just got to go get myself a new spouse because that's the reason why I'm unhappy. But the reality is, is there's a disconnection. Disconnection always leads to unhappiness because we're not being fed in the area of our soul that is saying, feed me with relationships. Disconnection leads to unhappiness. Unhappiness leads to us finding some other idol to fill our time with. And as a result, when busyness overcomes us, guess what happens? We find ourselves even more what? Disconnected, which leads us unhappy, even more unhappy. So we fill our time schedule with another shift, or we fill it with another thing. We just gravitate to another thing. We just, we'll make more music. I'll make more music, or I'll, I'll just spend four hours on Facebook, goodness sake. I'll spend four hours. I will spend, I'll spend the next eight hours on a Saturday binge-watching the same show I've already seen three seasons of. I know all the words. I can quote this. I should have wrote this. I'm, I, I am that character right there. And we'll do that instead of connecting with a human being. We, we fill our time schedule with our busy busyaholic lifestyle, and we wonder why we're so lonely and we don't have a connection with the people that are even sleeping in our own bed. We, we find our children just saying, look at me. Will you look at me? Will you play with me? And we shove a screen in their hand, and we say, go off and play with that screen because you're getting in the way of my screen time. And all the while, their hearts are just screaming out to us, please, I'm feeling lonely. We're raising our children to be a generation of disconnected, unhappy, busy busyaholic people because we don't have enough sense to look at them in the eyes and to wrestle them and to tickle them and to care about the things they cared about. Yeah. Sorry for yelling. This is not just a modern day problem. This is something that happened in Jesus' day as well. You remember there was a woman named Martha? You remember she had a sister named Mary. And Luke writes in his gospel this few little verses for us as humans to gravitate to. And he paints a contrast of these two characters, these two sisters. They come from the same household, they have the same background, yet they have a very different perspective on relationships. We remember, basically, Jesus, who had frequented the home of Mary and Martha and their brother Lazarus often. And Jesus, whenever he went over there, he basically would teach the Bible and people would come over. And pretty much what they were doing is hosting a life group. Jesus was their teacher, and people would come, and they'd, they would have food, they would have singing, they would have prayer, and they would have the word. All the elements that make up true community. And you know what they would do is that they'd gather together, and they'd have these rich connections. And Mary, she found herself just sitting at Jesus' feet, just, just saying the great I am, and just looking at the great I am, and learning from the great I am. Just like, matter of fact, they even had a moment where, where Jesus actually tells them, I am the resurrection and the life. That's how close they were to Jesus. Like, they just like, they loved him, they knew him, they were known by him, they were accepted by him. But Martha had a different relationship than Mary. Remember, Martha was busy over in the kitchen. What was she doing in the kitchen? She was, she was preparing. She was cleaning. She was like making the lemonade, right? Splat. She's wiping the counter down, and she's looking at the casserole, just like, will this thing cook? We need to get this thing moving. And she was answering the door and welcoming people in. Please take your shoes off and come and have a seat here. Can I get you something to drink? And, man, we got to sweep up this mess. And, oh, man, the kids got chips on the floor. And what's going on with your kids over there? Oh, yeah, what are we doing? Oh, man, the temperature is too hot in this oven, and why won't this thing cook? and everything's bringing up, what's going on? I need help here. Jesus, won't you tell Mary that I need help? She needs to get to work. And this is what happened. She was so busy, she became disconnected from Jesus. And the disconnection led to her being pretty unhappy, didn't she? And this is what she wants. She goes, well, guess what? It must be everybody else's fault. Jesus, it's your fault. And Mary, it's your fault. Jesus, tell Mary she needs to get on my busyaholic lifestyle because I'm too busy for community. So you should be too busy for community. And I want all of you to join in on my dysfunction because if I'm unhappy, everybody needs to be unhappy. And Jesus is like, yo, Martha, chill. Josh Best version. Because Mary has chosen the more important thing. She's not concerned with all of the busyness. 
She's concerned first with connection. Because if you connect first, it puts into priority all the other busyness. You see, what happens is if your number one priority is your relationship with your husband and your children and those that are in your oikos, that group of people that make up your Christian life, when all of a sudden you're presented with another shift on a Sunday, you go, oh, yeah, yo, no, no, I can't do that. Because my, prior, my priority is not making another $150 today because $150 is not enough money to steal away what my heart and soul really craves, and that's connection. No, I I won't pick up another shift at the cost of me missing my life group. These are my people. I'm not gonna pick up, I'm not gonna pick up a job that might give me another twenty thousand dollars a year, which which just would be great. Imagine the things we could buy and feel so unhappy with. It'd be so great. The electronics we could fill in our house, we'll be so unhappy with them, it'll be great. We'll have possessions, but we won't have the thing that our soul really, really craves, and that's connection with the people that we love. Who are we really doing it for? (laughs) Matter of fact, actually, what we find is this is something, this this progression of modern technology, not just technology, but a progression in society and this this American dream and this pursuit to have more and do more so changes and shifts people's priorities and how they live. That matter of fact, we find that 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 organizations like that are centered around membership. Researchers tell us that membership of organizations that create connection have dropped continually since World War II. We're talking about organizations like churches or or clubs or leagues or societies or lodges. You know, these just, it could be be biblical, it could be secular groups that have gathered together for the purpose of let us create community. They've actually been on a rapid and consistent decline since World War II. That across the board, what used to once be thriving hubs of relationship and connection are scarcely attended. Maybe, matter of fact, maybe you have even noticed this same issue yourself. Have you noticed over the, I'd say for me, it seems like the past 10 years, there's been such a huge decrease in the attendance of celebrations and family or friend-centered events. I'm I'm constantly, as a pastor, having people tell me, I can't believe more people didn't show up to my wedding. All the time. I can't believe people didn't show up to my father's funeral. I can't believe more people didn't show up to my party. Listen, we have more communication of these events than ever. You get get an email, Evite. You get a text from a person. You get a Facebook event created. They're reposting that Facebook event every other day. You even clicked that you were going, but yet you don't show, and they don't show. And even if people do show, they seem to show up just long enough to be cordial, to like, you know, hang out a little, say hi, give some warm hugs, and then say they got to go. But what is the number one reason why they got to go? It's because I am what? I'm busy. But they're not busy. They're just busy creating their own isolation. As a matter of fact, even when we hang out in these groups, don't you notice that, that, that these celebrations are no longer ones where people will dance and enjoy and talk and party, but everybody's staring at their phones. And so we're, we're all at a party. And we're all, we're all literally scrolling through the same Instagram feeds, hitting like on the same posts. We're all watching the same. And we're like, this, all the time I get, people are scrolling. They're like, oh, this is a funny video. Watch this video. And I'm like, I don't want to watch your video. I want to watch my own videos on my own feed. Stop putting your video on my face. I don't want to see that funny meme. If I wanted to look at pictures, I'd go on Instagram myself. I want to look at you. I want to talk to you. I want to talk about my struggles, and I want to, I mean, I want to, like, let's at least fight. Can we at least fight? Let's fight. <laughs> Hug me, please. We need to make a connection. One is the loneliest number. <laughs> Even when we're at these events, people are disconnected. We could be at a party, and everyone's having their own party with me, myself, and an iPhone. <laughs> own world. It's no wonder that loneliness leads to one of the greatest epidemics that's rising in the United States right now. It's called depression. Matter of fact, uh, my Amber, she's 13 years old. I'm forcing her to play soccer at her school this year. She's amazing. So she signs up for her doctor's physical. And uh, we take her to her appointment, and they bring in a clipboard, and they're kind of like secretly off to the side like, and here you go, honey. Why don't you fill this out? And mom's like, what are you doing over there? 
what do you got? And they're like, oh, nothing. We just, we kind of have to have her fill that out independently because we don't want you to affect the information that goes on it. And Carrie's like, well, what is it? And they're like, well, it's, it's a depression evaluation form. The doctor says, because in middle school and high school students, we've seen a skyrocket of depression and suicide. And the medical field is dumbfounded, and they're doing what the medical field does, and that's research to figure out how to medicate, because we can't seem to stop it. And Carrie says, well, well what do I do? I mean, what, do, what, what should we tell parents to do? And this is what the doctor's advice. She said, get your children away from screens and into real relationships. This is secular, non-biblical doctors saying, we, we're finding that the problem is everybody's focused on themselves Everybody's filling their synapses of their brain with instant gratification of images constantly that nobody can look across from somebody and says, who are you really? What we're actually doing is we're saying, who is the best person of you? Now that your makeup's on point, you want to post a picture and show everybody how fly you look today. But, but I want to see you at, you know, 6 a.m. when you wake up. Like, you know, you look great in that filter, but there is no faking a filter of real life. And when people look at you and they say, how are you? And you're like, I'm fine. And they're like, are you okay? And you're like, yeah, I'm okay. How dare you? I mean, did you not see my Instagram photo of me yesterday? <laughs> you, you, people are like, I love, oh, it's so great. You post on Instagram. You guys had a barbecue. That's great. And you think you know me because you saw that I had a barbecue on Instagram two days ago. But you don't know me. You don't know me. Matter of fact, I can sit inside of a home and not even have my family know me. I'm not saying that's the case, but I'm saying it's possible for us, is it not? So it's our world, guys. And the crazy thing with this busy holic lifestyle that we live is it's not actually doing anything but just spinning the wheels of our brains, spinning the wheels of our brains. We're not actually accomplishing anything. We're just, we're just busying ourselves. And we, we need to ask, we need to ask this. For whom? For whom am I toiling? For whom am I busying myself? Where's all of this work every day? At least for him, he was amassing wealth. The sad part is it was Hevel because he didn't have anyone to share it with. So he made a whole bunch of money, but he didn't have nobody to actually live it out with. And for some of us, it's not, just, it's not the money thing. For some, of us, for some of us, it's the money thing. For some of us, it's not the money thing. It's, it's all the work and all the time and all the, even just the busyness. And, and it's like, you know, we can't, we can't make the excuse that we have a television here and we watch television because we have family time. As soon as our kids are too loud, we're saying, shut up and go to the other room and go watch your movie over there. Because it's, it's, not, it's not for family time. It's to busy our minds because we need, we, need, we need something to just busy the unhappiness that we find because we're stuck in a cycle. Why am I banking so many hours? Why, why is so much time invested in this? Why eight hours of binge watching this same show? Why four hours going through social media? Why do I got to watch you know, 30 minutes and 45 minutes of failed videos. And what, like, what, what, is, what is the point of all this? What actually are we so busy for? And you might say, well, the reason why I work so much and I give so much and I got so many shifts and I do so much is for my family. It's for my future. It's for my children. But, but what do those people really want? What do they really want? And I know many of you, because you're on social media, have maybe seen this video. But check this out with me. If you could have dinner with anyone, living or dead, who would you choose? Carly Minogue. Oh. <laughs> Marilyn Monroe. Oh, God, I wouldn't have a clue. I know, straight up. Paul Hogan. Kim Kardashian. No, no, no. I'd like to have dinner with Justin Bieber. <laughs> what? He's not coming to my house. So, um... <laughs> I'd have Bob Hawke. Dave Hughes. Barry Humphreys. Jimi Hendrix. People who have made a difference in the world, maybe Nelson Mandela at the dinner table. If you could have dinner with anyone in the world, oh. who would you choose? Probably our whole family, like a whole extended family. Mum and Dad. Oh. Mum and Dad. Does it have to be a celebrity? Could it be family? We love it. We talk about how school is. We ask Mum and Dad how their day was. Family. Yeah, Mum and Dad. Family. Who would you guys like to have dinner with? They just want to be with us mm. while they're eating food. 
which is pretty cool. They see us above everything. Oh, I'm gonna get. Yeah. Yeah. Bit, bit of a message in it for me. Yes. <laughs> really doing it for? That's the question. Who, who am I, all this work and all this toiling, all this, who is all of this for? As a matter of fact, I found myself staring in the same exact mirror last year, and we've, I've said this repeatedly here as a church, you know you walked through it with me. I had to actually ask myself, for whom am I toiling? For whom? Who am I doing all of this work for? I mean, even as the most noblest of positions, the pastor, like, who am I really toiling for? Am I really working for my family? Am I really working to serve others? I, mean, I found myself, I wasn't even really working for God. I wasn't working for you. I'll tell you who I was working for. I was working for me. I was, I had, uh, add, add more meetings, that's fine. Counsel more people, that's great. Produce more content, that's great. great. Write more sermons, have more speaking engagements, go more places, that's great. I'll tell you what I found myself doing, and I didn't know it until I stepped out. I didn't step out until, and until I stepped out, then I heard all the noise that was happening over there. And you know what it was? It was white noise. You know what happens with white noise? White noise masks unwanted sound. That's what white noise does. How many of you guys have a fan next to your bed, right? And it goes, right? And you just like, you, you can't sleep without your fan, right? And, and some of us, like, we, there's white noises. Some, for some of us, our workplaces create them specifically so that way we would be like drones locked into what it is that we do. And that's what white noise does. It creates things around us so we don't hear what's really going on inside of us. All of us have white noise. For most of us in this room, the busyness of our life has actually created white noise so we don't hear what's really screaming on the inside. So here's a question you must ask yourself. What do we use to mask our unwanted emotions? What do we use to mask our boredom, our anxiety, our stress, our insignificance, our sadness, our grief? You see the difference between those emotions and the emotions of loneliness, however, is loneliness isn't an indicator necessarily that something is wrong in me, but something is wrong around me. And the preacher uses some very practical wisdom to solve this. Matter of fact, it's familiar wisdom. Matter of fact, I preached these same exact words six weeks ago. And I'm like, Jesus, do I gotta preach this again? And he's like, yeah. And I'm like, I just preached it. He's like, yeah, but they don't listen to you anyways. <laughs> The preacher says, two, here's your solution. You ready for your loneliness? Two are better than what? One. Because they have a good return for their labor. In the physical, this makes sense. Two are better than one. You have to move your couch, you better get a friend, right? Because you're going to have a better return for your labor. But in the spiritual, listen, you will go farther faster if you do it with a friend. You'll go farther faster if you, if you grow spiritually with a community. If you're all about your personal relationship with Jesus and your own little, and instead of actually doing it with a community and actually, and instead of actually moving forward with what we around here would call life groups, you're not going to go as far as you can because you always go farther faster when you do it with another person. Verse 10 says, if either of them falls down, one can help the other up, but pity anyone who falls and has no one to help them up. This makes sense in the physical as well. You're out on the field, you fall down, your team members don't say, now roll off the field, fool, right? What do they do? They come and they pick you up, and when your ankles roll, they become your legs. They become your weight. They help. If you fall into a ditch and you bust your knee, it's really great to have a friend to kind of help you get up, to dust off. But the same spiritual. Matter of fact, you have to ask yourself this question. If you had a moral failure today, God forbid, but if you had a moral failure today, is there anyone in your life that would help pick you up? Would people abandon you? Is there anybody in your life that would say, here, let me help heal you. Let me help walk with you. Let me help restore you to the cross of Jesus Christ. Or is it just you and Jesus? Like you're like, oh, that person was my wife. But what if it was against your wife? Would you have anyone? If it was your husband against your husband, would you have anyone? Would you feel comfortable with anyone in your life that actually knows you and you know them that would help pick you up, that would help move you forward? He continues to say, verse 11, also, if two lie down together, they will keep warm. But how can one keep warm alone? It's a great physical application. I don't 
I'll have a spiritual one for this. Verse 12. Though one may be overpowered, two can defend themselves. It's better. We fight better in community. It's better to find defense when we have brothers and sisters that have our back. In the physical, if, if, I, if, I, needed, like, if I needed somebody, somebody wanted to fight me in the parking lot, I, I, I just love it if Ed was next to me. <laughs> Come on, bro. Have my back, man. If I'm overpowered, I'll just call Ed. Ed! I'll be all wrapped up. Ed! And Ed could come and help me out. Two are better than one for sure, right? But in the spiritual, the same is true. If I'm wrapped up and caught up and and, and I'm being attacked by the enemy, I can call Ed and be like, Ed, bro, help me out. And he could pray for me and he could lead me and he could give me correction and he can give me the words. If you're doing that on your own, you're not going as far as you can, as fast as you can. We need community. And likewise, to close, he says, a cord of three strands is not quickly what? And we, some of us have been in the word of God long enough to know who is the third strand? Jesus. Jesus is the third strand. You know, two are better than one. It's great to have somebody in your life. And that's really, this is the solution. Is if you are not known, and you're not vulnerable, and you don't have somebody in this world that knows you for who you are and accepts you exactly the way you are, you're probably lonely in here today. You might have a community of people all around you, but nobody really knows you. And that leads to a distance and a disconnection that leads to loneliness. What you need to do is just be real. You need to be honest. And I'll tell you, the best way for that to actually happen is to weave in Christ into our community. We need to have Jesus woven into all of our community situations. And listen, Jesus is the cord that forms the unbreakable bond when it comes to community and relationships. If Jesus is at the center, then guess what? We find an unbreakable bond because Jesus comes and fills our community with love and grace and peace and forgiveness and acceptance. He's the acceptance. He's the one that brings the acceptance. He's the one that brings the forgiveness, that brings the peace. Matter of fact, since the very beginning, we have seen that our God is a Trinitarian God, which means he is a God that is created as God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy— not created, I'm sorry, don't rewind. We see since the beginning that we serve a Trinitarian God. A God that has eternally been God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. That those three make up the community that is the oneness of God. That God has and always been community. And then he looks at, at, at the dust of the earth and he says, let's, let's create man. And they have a meeting amongst themselves as a trinity. Let us create man in our image. So this is what they do. They create man out of the dust of the earth and they breathe their spirit into him and they design man with community. And then they look at all their creation. They saw the galaxies and the stars, and they said it's good. And they saw the waters, and they said it's good. And they saw the mountains and the trees and the birds and the bees, and they said it's all good until they looked at man who is alone in the garden, and they say it is not good that man should be alone. Bible teachers or anybody who studies God's word would know that according to the law or the right of first mention, the first time it's ever been mentioned, that it gets the right to interpret everything else from there moving forward in the Bible. So that moment, the first time ever God says it is not good, sets the standard for the entire Bible to say it is not good ever that a human being would be alone. That isolation is anti-God, anti-God's will, anti-God's plan. It's not God's plan for you to be alone. I'm not just talking in a marriage sense. I'm talking in a relational sense. I'm talking in a connection sense. From there, he gives Eve to Adam and creates the first human form of community. So listen, married people, here's the trick. If you're married and you feel alone, I'll tell you why. It's probably because you're missing the third cord strand. What it is. If you're married and you're alone, I'll tell you what you need to do. Husbands, take five minutes, five minutes to turn off electronics and read the Bible. Now, here's your pride as a man. You're like, I can't do that today because pastor said it today. I got to wait like a week or two weeks. No, do it today. Listen, go home and with your wife, read her the Bible and pray. Wrestle your kids and have fellowship with them and eat a meal. Do those things. And that, like, bring Jesus into community. And what will happen is it will be the strand that strengthens your community. Listen, if you're not married and you're a single mom, do that with your kids. 
daddies go home, do that with your kids. If you're just like, all I got is my homies, I just got my friends, right? Just go do it with your friends. Just, just do that. Bring Jesus as the third core strand into your friendship, and it, all of a sudden you will be known. Because when Jesus and his word is in the mix, you begin to share. You begin to talk about who you are. There's love and forgiveness and correction and acceptance and a wrestling. And you go farther, faster because you're doing it together. You're not just doing it with another person. You're doing it with Jesus. And, and it just brings you farther than ever. And some of you guys are like, my problem is not only do I not have a spouse, but I, and I don't have children, and I don't even have a friend. Like, how do I get a friend? How do I get community? And I, and I have a solution for all of you right this now, but especially for the really isolated lonely people here number one number one get out of bed okay okay because it's not God's plan that you only love your bed and your mama I'm sorry <laughs> that's not God's plan that's Drake's plan God's plan God's plan it's not good that man be alone number two listen here's what you got to do you got to get off the busy cycle get off of that Get into community like you're like, I'm too busy for community. Get into community and watch community force something else out. It'll force something that you don't need in your life out. If you don't have time, force it into your schedule and watch something that's not of the Lord die. And you'll be like, I'm so glad that that happened, okay? Connect. And number three, listen, get you and or your family in a life group. I preached this same exact text six weeks ago. And some of you still didn't get a life group because you're sinners. <laughs> and you're disobedient, rebellious people. Or you live in the busy cycle, and your excuse was, I'm too busy for, and so I'm disconnected. And maybe for the first time, you're really coming to grips with the fact that you're lonely and unhappy. And you're unhappy because you're busy. And your busy has led to disconnection. And your disconnection has led to this feeling and, and you're like, what, what do I need to add to my life? I'm telling you what you need to add to your life. Other human beings that know how much you suck and, how, <laughs> and also how rad you can be. Because you've got horrible parts to your life that you don't want people to know. But also you have such tremendous gifts. That if, and I tell this to people all the time. I need you in my life. And I'm not lying when I say that. Because if I don't have you in my life, I'm missing. I'm missing out on the body of Christ. You notice Jesus doesn't just save us and send us to heaven. He saves us, and then he sticks us in a body. And then we go and work 80 hours and wonder why we're so miserable. We're gaining a bunch, toiling a bunch. And we're asking ourselves, who am I doing all of this for? And Jesus is like, good question. Matter of fact, you're about to lose it all. You fool. Tonight, your life is required of you. And maybe it's not a life or death situation, but you're about to lose it all. Some, some in this room, you're about to lose it all. You think you're gaining it all in your own control, and you're about to lose it all. Simply because you won't obey a simple command of Jesus to be connected into the body of Christ. For some of you, this will be the third or fourth or fifth time you lost it all. And you're just stuck in this cycle, and you, <laughs> nobody's ever told you how to get out. I'll tell you how to get out. Obey Jesus. Get connected. It's so crazy simple. Get connected. Be known. And it'll just, it'll solve so much that's going on in here. Matter of fact, and this is the last thing I'll say, this was modeled for us by the greatest man who ever lived in the entire world. He came to be an example to mankind. His name was Jesus. The first thing he does after he enters into uh, ministry he goes and he gets baptized and he's sent into the wilderness to be tempted and he comes out and he's, he's ready for ministry. And what happens? The first thing he does, he goes and he starts calling his disciples. And he chooses 12 men to live in a life group with him. And that life group was for life until the end of his life. And he just grabbed onto those people and he did life with them. And he knew them and he accepted them. And he was known by them and accepted. Listen, the big idea, even modeled for us by Jesus, is that we would find our community, that we would find the people that God has called us to be connected to. For some of you, you need to go and fix your family. For some of you, you need to bring your dysfunctional family to a life group. I know, I got 14 children in my life group. And we are, this cackling lady over here is in my life group. It's dysfunctional. Yeah, me and her together, it's just a mess. But it's beautiful, isn't it? 
it's so beautiful to cry together and laugh, beat our kids together, you know what I mean? <laughs> our first week, we're all so sweet to our kids. We're like, now, now, don't do that. By the third week, we're like, you hurt me, <laughs> right? And he's like, yeah, get him, get him, get him, right? <laughs> Finally warming up and being real with each other, and it's great to be known, right? It's great to be known. It's great to know. It's great to accept each other. I'll never be lonely. I got these people in my life. I want more connections. I want to be known by more people because that's what Jesus teaches us. Matter of fact, okay, I said that was the last thing, but that was a preacher lie. One more thing. Jesus, his last thing he ever did, it was his choice. It's like, you know, make a wish foundation. What's the last thing you want to do, right? And Jesus, he makes the decision. This is the last thing he's going to do in life before he begins the process of going to Calvary was the last thing he did. Think about it. Before he enters into the garden and starts the process of heading to the cross, what's the last thing Jesus did? He sat down with his life group called the disciples, and he shared the word, prayer, fellowship, and a meal. The last thing he did. And he takes bread and he breaks it and he says, listen, this is my body. And he brings a cup of wine, everybody takes a drink. He's like, this is my blood. And he calls it communion. Communion means connection and oneness. And he says, as often as you do this, obviously with other believers, do it in remembrance of me. Saying, I started something before I died, a tradition. And I want you to carry this on all the way throughout history. Thousands of years, I want to see the church doing this over and over and over again. Connecting with me. Weaving Jesus into communion. And so we pray. Boy, I won't shut up. Please, let's pray. God, we come to you in Jesus' name. And we want to ask, will you be the three-chord strand in our life? God, there are husbands and daddies in here that need to take the simple step of humbling themselves and picking up a Bible and reading. Leading their family in prayer leading their wives in in the word of God and prayer, weaving Jesus into their life. Jesus, we, we need you to touch our hearts. There's some in here, Jesus, they know they need to be in community and their kids need to learn what it's like to be in community. And yet, even right now, they're resistant to wanting to even sign up for a life group and to even be around people. I pray that you break through that. I pray that, God, you would just touch their hearts and you'd help them, Lord. Church, there's a form in your bulletin. Put your name and phone number on it. We'll find you a group. God, I pray that you just work on hearts. I pray, Lord, that you would stir us towards this beautiful gift that you've given us, that you've modeled for us called communion. And we want to eat and drink in remembrance of you. And of the oneness that you bring us with God the Father, you bring us into your community, this eternal family that you have forever. And you invite us to the table to eat. And you invite us to the yard to play ball. And you invite us into the kingdom to have our own home. And you invite us into this throne room so we can call your daddy Abba and give us access to worship and to know you and to fully accept you and to be known by you and to be fully accepted by you. And it's such a wonderful relationship that you've provided Jesus and we want to just thank you for that. And we just want to ask, will your Holy Spirit just have this little bit of time?